Thank you. Um, well, first, I, uh, speaking of COVID and, and mild COVID, I just I just hope that this seminar continues after COVID because I really uh, I really am enjoying this these uh, remote uh, <coughs> style of seminars. Um, so yeah, so thanks to the organizers for for running this and the and the Western Hemisphere seminar. Um, okay, so uh, so this is. Um, <clears throat> this is an experimental talk. Uh, usually, I, um, I either write my talk in real time or I prepare slides. And somehow, it takes either x minutes or 2x minutes for the same amount of material. <clears throat> one was less than 60 and one was more than 60. So I'm trying a, a hybrid approach where it's partially written especially the inter the beginning stuff which i think is review for most people and then it like has blanks and we'll see if i can get this to 60 minutes i have no idea uh if this will work okay that was already two minutes okay so uh this is based this is joint work with uh, yorgos dimitroglu Rizel, um and it's based on a couple of preprints um uh this one i already talked about in the western hemisphere seminar and and this one we posted yesterday um okay so um so as usual we have this sort of like uh <clears throat> symplectic row and contact row and closed column and column with boundary and i tend to live here uh and i watch what all the what all of you guys do in here and then try to adopt it here so uh what i was going to do is just sort of review some of the inspirational results from row one uh, on quantitative and then try to translate them into this uh, into this um, uh, bottom right corner. OK, so uh, so what are some results? Um, so um, right, OK, so of course we have this cel celebrated uh, uh, Gromov non-squeezing theorem. Um, so row one in the 80s. So if we have a, a symplectic ball uh, defined as such, uh, and it symplectically embeds into a cylinder where only the first two coordinates of the cylinder are constrained, um, then in fact, um, uh, you have to um, constrain uh, all the coordinates of the ball. Um, OK, and then we have this thing called, you know, I guess they call it C0 symplectic topology. I'm not exactly sure when this is from, but uh, I'll attribute it to, to these two guys, Eliasberg and Gromov. And so that is, if you have a, a sequence of symplectomorphisms and uh, at C0 converges to a diffeomorphism, then um, the, uh, the limit is uh, symplectomorphism. OK. And then um, sort of the third sort of, um, this is now, I'm doing the uh, row one, column two, the Lagrangian version of this. So um, at least in the 80s, this was floor, I guess. I'm not, I don't think O did stuff in the 80s on that. Um, but anyway, um, so if you take a Lagrangian uh, and a symplectic manifold, um, so that is the symplectic form vanishes on the cotangent uh, on the tangent bundle, um, and you take a uh, Hamiltonian isotopy. So again, uh, I'm assuming everyone knows what this is, but I'll just say it because it's I, I can go through this part quickly because it's written down. Uh, so that is that you have this Ham uh, uh, the <clears throat> the vector field that induces this isotopy uh, when paired with the symplectic form. There might be a sign here I'm missing. I don't remember. Uh, is as D is some Hamiltonian, and moreover, assume that um, that uh, the the image under the Hamiltonian is transverse. The image of the Lagrangian under the Hamiltonian is transverse. Then you want to say that the number of intersection points of this is at least the sum of the Betty numbers of the Lagrangian. This is now this is a singular homology here, not floor homology. And of course, as stated, this is not true in general, but some something like this is sometimes true. OK, um, so uh, 
then there were many improvements to these results uh, in subsequent decades. So lumping these all together, um, we have here a C0, a C0 uh, statement. So that's Lodenbach, Sikharov, 94, Opstein, 2009, uh, Humilier, Leclerc, uh, Sefadini, and 15. Um, apologize if these years aren't right. I think I go back and forth between the archive year and the publication year. But anyway, um, the statement is that uh, if you have a sequence uh, in the symplectomorphisms, again, uh, with C0 converging, but now we don't a priori know that this limit is a diffeomorphism, but just a homeomorphism. And you start with some co-isotropic submanifold such that it's, it's limiting, its limit is smooth then it actually preserves the co-isotropic property. So I, I'm most interested in when it's a Lagrangian and the limit is Lagrangian. I guess that one was probably due to, due to these guys first. Okay, so that's sort of uh, one improvement. Um, yeah, and I guess, I guess this could actually prove the previous result if you kind of argue with graphs and such, I don't know. Um, all right. Okay, another statement that I didn't actually discuss in the 80s that I guess sort of only have started appearing in the 90s is um, in terms of this Hoffer metric. Okay, so what's that? So, okay, so let's suppose we have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of our symplectic manifold. Okay, and what we want to do is we say, okay, let's look at all of the Hamiltonian functions, all of the Hamiltonian functions whose time one, time one map generates this uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Um, and let's look at, I guess, what's called the oscillation norm of the Hamiltonian, which is you integrate, um, you look at the maximum of the function uh, uh, over the manifolds, subtract from that the minimum of the function over the manifold. These are time dependent functions. So for each time I have a maximum and for each time I have a minimum, I look at their difference. I integrate from zero to one this, this difference, and I call that um, my oscillation of the Hamiltonian. And I look for the minimum oscillation of a Hamiltonian that generates uh, this um, Hamiltonian, uh, this, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Okay, and I call that the Hoffer norm of, of this guy. And uh, I could define a, a Hoffer metric um, between two elements in here. Uh, using uh, this expression, okay, and um, then also, so that's the Hoffer metric for Hamiltonians. Then also, I have a if I have a Lagrangian in here, I can look at its orbit space. That is, I look at all of the other Lagrangians which I can get to from my original Lagrangian via a Hamiltonian, and on this space I can define. I actually don't know what it's called, but I'm going to call it the Chikhanov Hoffer metric. Um, if someone knows that it should be called something else, please let me know. Um, but anyway, so how do I do this? I say, well, let's look at two Lagrangians in this orbit space and let's find um, all the um, Hamiltonians that will take one to the other. And let's look at the minimum uh, Hoffer norm of this Hamiltonian, and that's uh, what we call the Hoffer metric. Okay, so now some quantitative results about this. Um, let's see, so I guess Lalonde McDuff in 95 showed that this Hoffer metric was non-degenerate, and then Chikhanov in 2000 showed that this Chikhanov Hoffer metric is also non-degenerate. And there's a lot of work uh, about when this Hoffer metric is even finite. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about any of that though but I just wanted to focus on the non-degeneracy. Okay, so that's sort of, I guess you could say a new quantitative result in the 90s that I guess didn't really have an analog in the 80s. Um, let's see, what page am I on? Okay, that was 10 minutes, six pages out of 20. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be less than an hour. Actually, the last few pages, I've got spaces for me to write stuff down to slow myself down. So this is that'll be the experimental part. Um, okay. Um, is that all I wanted to say? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I skipped a page. Yeah. Okay. 
displacement. Okay, so um, so we had this Arnold conjecture, or maybe it's like the Arnold Giventhal conjecture. I can't remember. Anyway, the thing that I attributed to Floor in '88, which I said wasn't true, which is that uh, a Lagrangian and its image under a Hamiltonian have to have at least the number of intersection points is at least bounded from below by the sum of the Betty numbers. Well, that's not true, but there is something, a quantitative version of it, which, which is true due to Chikhanov. And that says that, um, okay, so again, we start with a Lagrangian. And now we look at Hamiltonians and we're, and we're gonna, we're gonna wanna count intersections of the Lagrangian and its image under, under Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, under Hamiltonian isotopy, but we're only gonna look at small Hamiltonians. And so, what do we mean? What do I mean by small? Well, I mean that um, I mean that the oscillation norm is bounded below by the minimum area of J holomorphic disks and spheres. So, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, first, that's pretty vague, but basically, I mean I I pick an almost complex structure J compatible with the symplectic structure. I look at all J holomorphic disks with boundary on the Lagrangian. I look at all J holomorphic spheres. Uh, in the symplectic manifold. And then I'm actually, it's actually a little better than this. I can kind of vary my J and make J, choose J such that this min is possible, as big as possible. So I could have like a max outside of here. But anyway, let's just assume it's small in this sense. Then in this case, um, the number of intersections is bounded, is bounded below by the sum of the Betty numbers. Um, and I, I, by the way, when I write some of Betty numbers here, I'm skipping the notion of what coefficients I'm in. I'm skipping the notion of is my are are my various things orientable spin? Is there a coherent orientation? There's all sorts of bells and whistles you can add to this. Okay, so all right, so we have all these quantitative results, and now there are there are different proofs of them, but I'm going to focus on this sort of proof, which kind of runs through a lot of these statements. Um, I'll call it the floor recipe. And the floor recipe has four steps. Okay, so first, first you input your geometric data. So, you know, you may have a symplectic manifold. That's in, if, you, if you're in column two, you also have a Lagrangian. You've got some Hamiltonian diffeomorphism that's moving stuff around. Okay, that's sort of a natural, the natural input. And then, then we're gonna put in some auxiliary stuff like name most notably an almost complex structure this is an this is a some somewhat arbitrary choice okay so we put all this in and then we need to either prove with a lot of work or prove with less work but add some hypotheses the following statements that if we look at the moduli space of j holomorphic curves okay so these are these might be spheres these might be holomorphic disks with Lagrangian boundary condition, I'm not sure what, and we compactify it in the sense of Gromov, then we can do enough analysis to show that this moduli space, at least certain of these moduli spaces are manifolds. Um, we don't really need them all to be manifolds, but we need some of them to be manifolds. And then we use manifolds of certain dimension related to some sort of Maslow index or something. Okay, and then we sort of look at zero dimensional moduli space, one dimensional moduli space, and also what I call minus one dimensional moduli space because we study one parameter families of these situations. And so one dimensional moduli space can appear at instantaneous moments. We study these spaces and using this Gromov compactness and some gluing, we define uh, what one would call a floor chain complex. Um, where basically it's a function of all of this data and you usually see it as CF. Okay, and once we've able to do this, we're then gonna extract some information from this floor chain complex. Like for example, we might take the homology of the floor chain complex, or maybe we'll be a little more delicate and we'll, we'll um, you know, study the barcode, or maybe if you're going to MSRI next semester and you'll be even more delicate and you'll study some homotopy theory underlying these, some spectra underlying these chain complex. I don't know what, what you want to take out of this, uh, but you extract some algebra from this, okay? And then finally, in the last step of this recipe, you sort of, 
use the invariance. Now, this thing might not be invariant all the time. You might, you might disturb the situation too much so that your algebra is destroyed. But at least you might have some limited invariance about this algebraic information. And that will give you your desired um, sort of rigid quantitative results, these results that I've been talking about, like you know, C0 limits and lower bounds of intersections and so on. Anyway, so these, these are the four steps that sort of go into these uh, results that went into these or can go into these results from the 80s, 90s, oddies, 10s, and this decade. Okay, so um, what I would, so that's, that is the end of the story for row one, the symplectic slash Lagrangian story. So what I want to do is I want to translate this row one, this entire story to row two which is the contact story and, and more specifically the Legendrian story. Okay, so first thing, I have four steps. First, I have to translate the geometric data. Okay, well, that's pretty straightforward. So in row one, I had a Lagrangian, I had a symplectic manifold. Okay, that's gonna play the role of a Legendrian and a contact manifold. And a, a contact manifold, remember, is odd dimensional. It has a contact distribution which for us can be written as the kernel of what's called a contact one form. And remember, Legendrian just means that the co sorry, the tangent bundle of the submanifold, this is n-dimensional, uh, sits inside this uh, distribution. OK, so that's the thing we want to study. OK, uh, right. And then we also want to see how uh, the other thing we want to study is what happens when the situation changes. So he, before, we were changing it by a contact Hamiltonian. Uh, now we're, sorry, uh, sorry, a regular Hamiltonian. Now we're going to change it by a contact Hamiltonian. Now, um, this contact Hamiltonian, uh, it's a little, the the, it's a little more cumbersome, this notation, because I have to specify the contact form. So rather than phi sub t h, it's phi sub t alpha h. Alpha is what I'm going to use for the contact form in this talk. And uh, so here's sort of the definition of the contact um, Hamiltonian. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and what's also important here is uh, a Reeb vector field. Again, uh, this is a vector field on the contact manifold. It does depend on the contact form and it's defined via these two equations. OK. And now um, the generators of the floor complex you know, it can be different things, but the one that I'm interested in in row one, the symplectic story, was when it was Lagrangian intersection points between L and its image under a Hamiltonian. Or actually, to be a little more general, I might want to say the image under um, under uh, the image of a different Lagrangian under the Hamiltonian, just to be totally general. But um, yeah, maybe maybe I shouldn't put thrown that in there yet. Okay. Uh, now that's going to be translated into what we call Reeb chords between uh, the Legendrian and its image under the uh, contact Hamiltonian. Now, why do we not just do? Why don't we just do intersection points? Well, because generically, this guy is n-dimensional. This guy is n-dimensional. They're sitting inside two n plus one. They're not going to intersect. There's no intersections. However, just like generically, you can say there's somehow a discrete or finite set of points intersection points of this, you can say that there's a discrete, and it might not be finite, but it has a sort of appropriate finiteness growth, um, the set of Reeb chords between these two guys. And by the way, so I'm going to write this as RC for Reeb chords. And actually, I'm not going to care which one's first or second. So I'm studying Reeb chords from this, starting on this Legendrian flowing to here, or starting here and flowing to there. Um, those I call mixed Reeb chords because they're going from one Legendrian to the other. We also, in our input, we need to study so-called pure Reeb chords. So that is Reeb chords that flow from the Legendrian to itself or the other Legendrian to itself. Okay, so, um, all right. Um, all right, okay, so that's, sorry, that's the translation uh, of step one. Okay, um, maybe I should slow myself down and just uh, no thing in chat. Okay, so I guess throw in a chat if you have a question. I don't know. 
who this is, if there's any, any younger souls out there for whom this is new. Um, okay, so now we want to translate step two. Okay, so, so this is the uh, compactness of our moduli space. So I'm not going to talk about, there's sort of, um, of course, there's the analysis translation, which I'm not going to get into, but because that takes too much. Uh, but, but I will talk about the Gromov compactness. Uh, so how does it work in symplectic geometry? Well, in symplectic geometry, you have this holomorphic disk. Uh, and we are looking at an intersection between the two Lagrangians. So, uh, and we want to see maybe what, how one of these one-dimensional moduli space, what its Gromov compactification, the limit, the boundary of its Gromov compactification looks like, and it looks sort of the same each time, um, presuming you have assume appropriate hypotheses where spheres can't bubble and whatnot, um, and you'll get, you know, these sort of bubble disks where you have this boundary, these two boundaries going to L and these two boundaries going to the image of L. And so that gives us that d squared equals zero if we kind of count. This picture gives us that d squared equals zero if we count d as these disks because we kind of match these up in pairs of design. And that means that the floor complex is well defined and uh, we can define, we'll, we'll call it something, you know, we might call it something like this and proceed uh, from step two to step three which is extracting algebra from it. Okay, now supposing we try to repeat this in um, contact geometry. So we, we again, we study holomorphic disks. Okay, I won't mention the fact, well, I'm mentioning it now. These holomorphic disks obviously can't live in an odd dimensional manifold, but they live in some symplectization, et cetera. Anyway, let's, let's ignore that point. But let's just look at what happens with the bubbling. So here, here if we do Gromov compactness, okay, we might get something that we like which is sort of two disks like this, going from this mixed chord to this mixed chord and this mixed chord to that mixed chord, that's all good. But we might get something that we don't like. Uh, this is a perfectly legitimate Gromov compactification where we have a bubbling occurring at a pure chord. So here we have a disk with one mixed chord, one mixed chord and one pure chord. And here we have a disk with one pure chord and nothing else. And so the way we extract that in algebra might be rather than d squared equals zero over here, we get something like this, where this is these count. <clears throat> um, well, where, where, this, where the subscript counts the number of so-called negative punctures. So this is a term. This is a term. This is like uh, d2. This is, um, uh, well, I don't know. Anyway, this, this is d0 and so on. Um, actually, this is, this looks like, <laughs> this looks messier, but, but actually, um, uh, this guy right here is probably, a probably doesn't count as a D1 term. It's some sort of cylinder anyway. Um, so, but anyway, the, the point, is, the point is, is it gets incorporated into an equation like this. And so rather than a chain complex, we get what's called the chikhanov eliashberg CE differential graded algebra, DGA. And uh, I'll use the notation A for it. So again, this is um, generated by chords. Um, actually, I should probably really write it as, at this point, I should write it as a union because I'm including pure chords. Um, and we get that it's well, we get that it's well defined. And uh, our invariant will be what's called the Legendrian contact homology, that is invariant under the various auxiliary choices like J, as well as Legendrian isotopy. Uh, so, okay. excuse me. Uh, so, it is indeed well defined on any contact manifold independently on properties of alpha? Uh, no. Um, so, you so have to make some. So, okay, in theory, it is. In practice, there is a subset for which it is well defined. But uh, you, the current technology, according to my understanding, uh, you have to make some assumptions about preventing certain bubbling because certain analytical results. Yeah, so even in theory, I mean, there is a kind of dream that it is uh, well defined, but uh, mm -hmm. in practice, you have to work under certain restrictions. That's right. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right. So, all right, so we get we get some kind of theory, and now we want to extract some useful algebraic information from it. Like in particular, I'm interested in barcodes, um, and uh, 
so how one might try to approach this. Okay, well, let's suppose big if here, let's suppose that our Legendrian has what's called an augmentation. Okay, so an augmentation, you may have seen this in different ways, like a Lagrangian filling or a map to the ground field. I like to think of it as a DGA morphism where I'm starting from the DGA and I'm mapping to the ground field or ground ring, where I think of the ground ring as having the zero trivial, the zero differential. Okay, let's suppose that it has an augmentation. Then we can so-called linearize the DGA. Now there are different ways to linearize the DGA. The way that I'm interested in linearizing it is, is defining what, what I would call a relative Rabinowitz floor chain complex. Okay, so in my case, uh, this complex is gonna be generated by mixed chords. Um, so that is, by the way, um, again, for people who are not familiar with this sort of theory, if I'm going too fast and, you, and you're reluctant to ask me questions, I will get to the results. So even if you start losing me on this discussion, um, you don't need to necessarily understand this to understand the statements of the results. Uh, I'm just, since this is such a specialized audience, I want to sort of do the proof first and then the statements or the attempt at the proof. Um, so this is also sort of experimental for me. I would never get, this would be like towards the end of the talk normally. Um, yeah, so, you know, feel free to go on Twitter or something if you need to, and then come back for the statements. This is um, too technical, I don't know. Um, or, or better yet, ask me some chat. Um, okay, uh, so what are gonna be the generators? The generators are gonna be mixed chords starting or ending on one Lagrangian going to the other Lagrangian. Okay, and so for example, here's a mixed chord X and a mixed chord Y. It has two different Legendrians coming in. So it's a chord going from this Legendrian to that one, this Legendrian to that one. And what we'd wanna count is um, sort of objects like this, where each time we have a pure chord, okay, so this means we change to a pure chord. We apply the augmentation to this pure chord here, here, and here. And so we actually just sort of count this disk and sort of weight it by these coefficients, okay? Um, and again, I'm also sort of ignoring, I guess what Leonid was maybe perhaps hinting at, I'm sort of ignoring that there could be some sort of bubble inside here. I might have some sort of, um, you know, some, some sphere bubbling here. And I would also have to augment it if, uh, if, this, uh, if this thing bubbled off, but um, let's ignore that sort of thing. Okay, so, and so we're gonna count these sorts of disks with these augmentations. Now this is, this is, you know, I'm geometrically drawing this as a broken disk with these bubbles here. But in, real, in, real, in reality, all I'm doing is I'm counting this disk and then I'm applying this algebraic augmentation. So geometrically, it looks like I might have some Lagrangian filling or something, and these disks really exist in my Lagrangian filling. But I don't really need a Lagrangian filling to do this. I, I just need the disk here and then some algebra applied here. Uh, so, so, so there is a question in yes. the chat. I just and saw and I have exactly the same question. So uh, uh, Dini is asking, uh, right? So okay. So uh, in what sense? Why, it, in which sense it is Rabinovitz? Okay, is that generators are only chords, not interior intersections. Only the bubbles can be augmentation disks. Okay, so it's Rabinowitz in the sense that um, when I do, uh, when I have to study invariance of this thing, I can have a one. See, the Legendrian does not self-intersect. And I'm assuming enough information to avoid interior bubbles. However, uh, during a, during sort of an, a translation invariance, I could have a chord turn into a double point and then turn into a chord between the other two. You know, going the opposite direction from you know from Legendrian one to Legendrian two becomes a double point becomes a chord from Legendrian two to Legendrian one. So um, I have to have a theory that. In, that accounts for that phenomenon. So that's that's why I'm calling it Rabinowitz. Sorry, so so your homology will be invariant uh, under situation when Legendrians self-intersects? Not self-intersects. Uh, one, well, one Legendrian component intersects the other Legendrian oh. component. Right, I have, a, I have two Legendrians. I have, I have, um, I have, I have this guy and I have this guy. 
yes. uh, by themselves, they're embedded. But I'm going to be interested in studying uh, what happens under an isotopy. And there's no, no reason I shouldn't think that the Legendrian pushes, you know, it moves around and passes through its original image. So I could right, have so, right, so 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 you want to, to study changes in Legendrian quantum homology under such intersection. Uh, in order to, to in order to extract an invariance proof and extract oh, quantitative oh, oh, results, oh, oh, I need okay, to okay. study the I understood. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. To define the complex though, uh you're sort of right. Uh I don't have interior intersection points. So uh, I wasn't gonna get that far though. Um at least I didn't prepare that much. Um, okay, all right. So we study we study this uh, Rabinowitz floor complex, um, and you know, again, this oops, this is um, this is assuming I have an augmentation, and I can do this. I'm going to proceed to step three as before. But uh, that's a that's a problematic assumption, at least for some people. I mean, other people, it's it's very interesting. Uh, especially people interested in sheaves, but for more like uh, you know quantitative geometry, there's some problems with that because um, according to Eli Ashberg, again I don't know when I don't I, somehow I don't know when my advisor did anything, and Murphy uh, most most in quotes Legendrians do not have augmentations. So in what sense do I mean most? Uh, well, so for example, you can do these sort of stabilizations and C0 approximate any knot in dimension one. Or in higher dimensions, uh, a result of Murphy says that you can take any smooth manifold and if you allow for loose Legendrians, which are basically Legendrians who so sort of have a little, little local front projection like this or like this called a loose chart, uh, you can C0 approximate any smooth manifold. Now, so what? Well, if we have in dimension one or in higher dimensions, a situation like this. So if we have, if it's st uh, stabilized or loose, then there's a little reeb cord here. Uh, it's, it's actually right here or right here. Um, there's a little reeb cord, uh, pure reeb cord from the Legendre to itself, such that the LCH differential of this reeb cord is one, or maybe more generally it's some unit and that's very problematic for two reasons. Well, first to answer the question about augmentations, it doesn't have an augmentation because if you just do this quick calculation, okay, so E of DX is epsilon of DX is epsilon of one. Epsilon is a homomorphism, so it's got to take it to one. That's definitely not zero in, in the ring uh, and any ring that we're interested in because it's a ring with unit. Uh, on the other hand, the ring has a zero differential. So that means that this equation does not hold. That means that epsilon is not a DGA morphism, that means there's no, cannot be an augmentation. Okay, well, so maybe, but even if you don't have an augmentation, you still have this DGA, this check on off the iceberg DGA I was talking about. Unfortunately, in the homology, the homology completely vanishes because one is equal to zero if you have DX equals one, one's in the image of D. So Legendre and contact homology, while still an invariant, is a not interesting invariant. So, um, so, so that that's a problem to, to this approach to trying to do this chikanoff eli uh, Try to try to use some kind of Rabinowitz chain complex to, to get a quantitative result. So, what is uh, an approach? So this is the approach that Yorgos and I do to, to achieve these quantitative results, even if we're studying loose Legendrians. So, um, we what we do is we, you know we're only interested in proving something holding for a certain amount of time, like Chikhanov's displacement thing. So what we can do is we, we, we introduce a kind of action window, and this is, um, which I'll, which would denote like this, A to B, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by this thing. Okay, so first, to introduce an action window, first I have to talk about the length of a Reeb cord. Okay, so, uh, so I take any Reeb cord, and what I do is I just pull back, I integrate the, I, I define its length to be the integral of the, the contact one form on this Reeb chord. Okay, now uh, I wrote this in and then decided that this might just confuse people, but since I, since I was already asked this, this sort of ties in with the fact that Reeb chords can have 
at least mixed Grebe chords can have length zero if they're a double point or um, negative length if they kind of go in the wrong direction. That is, if I take the, if the Reeb flow goes from, say, this Legendrian to that Legendrian, I kind of, and uh, again, this is really not something I'll have time to get to, but this sort of boils down to having to study differentials and co-differentials at the same time. Um, sorry, boundaries and co-boundaries at the same time. Anyway, but let's just ignore this point. Um, so let's stick with this fact. Okay, so uh, imagining that the lengths are all positive as, as it normally, as most people study things. Uh, so we have Stokes theorem, which says that uh, the Chekhanov Eliashberg differential decreases the length. And, and so then that means that if I look at this algebra made up of chords of length less than L, this um, because it, this length, uh, sorry, this differential respects the filtration of this length, I get that this algebra is in fact a sub DGA. And uh, note that it's that no matter how small L is, it's never trivial because it always has at least one in it, it has one and zero. The sort of empty Reeb chord is in there. Uh, so that means that any Legendrian, loose or not, there's always going to be some L for which this DGA has an augmentation. It may only be the algebra generated by one, or maybe I'm going to take all chords shorter than the smallest length, the smallest loose chart or something like that. Uh, but I can still study sort of a an algebra, a DGA theory um, on partially, on a, I can still, uh, yeah, do a sub DGA algebra. Okay, so now let me try to explain what the sort of Rabinowitz complex that we're going to be interested in studying. Uh, so we're going to look at mixed chords. So here's here's a picture of a mixed chord. So this is um, you know going on one Legendrian and this is going on the other Legendrian. There might be some augmentation. There might be some you know augmentations required. But as long as the action of the mixed chord, as long as the length is in between A and B, so the length of the mixed chord is between A and B. And as long as B minus A is less than L, where I can define an augmentation on, on these chords, pure chords of lambda and pure chords of its image of length less than L, I can proceed with this, um, with this uh, Rabinowitz floor theory. Because basically, you know, let's say I have, let's say this is X and this is Y, and this is like P1. Well, then I have zero is less than L of X minus L of Y uh, minus L of P1, uh, which is which is <coughs> um, less than uh, B minus A minus L of P1. Okay, so that implies that L of P1 is less than L. That implies that the augmentation exists. So. Um, so I can actually go ahead and count these disks and appropriately modify them, even though I don't have the augmentation globally defined. So there is some, perhaps some comp, again, this, um, you know, there might, I might not have two mixed chords which satisfy this a priori, that mixed chords might be quite far apart and the pure chords, there might be a small little loose chart there. Uh, but, you know, maybe I'll just have one mixed chord in my complex. Um, I don't know, it depends on the situation. Okay. Excuse me, uh, may, may I ask you, so could you please clarify uh, how you orient the chords? Because you might, uh, you mentioned that this integral of contact form of a chord could be negative. Yeah, okay. So uh, so what I what I didn't mention is that these chords, that these disks live in a, the chords are not oriented, but the disks treat, treat a, will treat a chord as an input or an output. And the way a disk treats a chord as an input or an output is this disk lives in a symplectization. And if it goes up to plus infinity, if it asymptotes to the chord at plus infinity, it'll be an input. Uh, um, <laughs> well, OK, if I, if I didn't, uh, without this extra step, which is what you're driving at. Yeah, OK, maybe I should really say it this way. So if it asymptotes to plus infinity and it's between lambda and lambda prime, it treats it as an input. If it asymptotes to plus infinity, 
and it's between lambda prime and lambda, it treats it as an output. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the other way. So I actually have, I sort of have a, that's sort of why I have a boundary and a co-boundary that I definitely wasn't going to get to, but uh, okay. that's, okay. that's how it's algebraically structured. So the, the, the whole complex is actually a, a mapping cylinder complex in, in the end. It's not, it's not a regular complex. It's a little more mapping cone complex, I guess, not a mapping cylinder complex. Okay. All right. So anyway, so, um, all right, I got those. All right. Oh, shoot. Okay, so now I'm at the point where I have to start writing stuff. Okay. Uh, all right, so now we get to, um, so that's sort of the ideas behind the proof of what? I haven't said anything. I haven't made a theorem yet. Okay, so, okay, I'm definitely not going to make it. Shoot, I should have done the whole thing in writing. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to do this in monochrome color to save some time here. Okay. So, um, so we had uh, we had this Chikhanov statement about um, uh, if if the Hamiltonian has a small oscillation norm, then there are still at least this many intersection points. Okay. So, what would be the Legendrian analog? Uh, so, let's say we're given uh, a Legendrian inside a contact manifold um, and a contact Hamiltonian. Um, okay. Uh, and we choose some L, which is greater than zero, such that, oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, okay. Let's order the Reeb chords. by their lengths. So generically, I can do this. OK. Um, and choose some L such that, um, uh, well, first of all, um, this has an augmentation. Uh, so for example, I could choose L to be less than the length of C1 if I wanted to. I could always do that. Um, and two, here's where this technical condition comes in about Leonid's first question. If gamma is a contractible uh, Rabe orbit um, and the expected dimension of these guys, so these finite energy planes the moduli space is a finite energy planes in the symplectization with positive asymptote at gamma. Uh, <coughs> uh, um, is less than or equal to one, uh, then um, it's too long to be considered. So if I pull back the form, I'm greater than this L. So this sort of bubbling is not going to be considered in my situation. Uh, then if the oscillation norm is less than the minimum of this L so that I have my augmentation and I avoid the bubbling I want to avoid for technical reasons. So you want to say that if dimension is less or equal than one, then it's big. Yeah. And so in particular, if it, uh -huh. okay. And let's say I'm also happen to be less than the kth longest chord. Um, this is in the second bound increases as I as k goes up. Then uh, the number of Reeb chords uh, between lambda and its image is greater than or equal to uh, the summation of. Uh, the sum of the Betty numbers uh, minus two k. So this is sort of a um, this is sort of a persistence of homo homology, not in some sense, a persistence of Reeb chords result. So this is like um, uh, right. So it's it's so if you if you look at Chikhanov's result, 
he says that like, well, I've got them all and then I have nothing. This, this result's a little uh, stronger because it says, well, I start with all of them, but um, as my oscillation, as I consider larger and larger oscillations, I start to lose them in pairs. And the proof is essentially looking at the barcodes of the Urbinowitz complex and watching these bars sort of possibly shrink and disappear in some way. And each time I have a bar disappear, it's sort of an endpoint and a start point of a bar have disappeared and I've lost two chords. That's very roughly the idea. Um, okay, so that's that's the first statement I wanted to mention. Um, okay, so uh, so some remarks about this. Um, so first of all, this again is about the question, you know, if there were some polyfold Kuranishi analysis, say for example, like Pardon's work, you combine Pardon's work with Tobias, uh, for, with Ekholm's work, and you somehow had, you could define sort of a, a DGA with coefficients and with periodic orbits and all that was done, then you could, you could improve this. Uh, we're only, uh, we only need a compactness result. We don't need gluing, and we also don't need invariance under the contact form because the contact form is fixed. Uh, so, but but we do need, uh, but with but without that technology, we have to throw in assumption two. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is that I talked about this in the Western Hemisphere symplectic seminar. In this case, uh, when it's p cross r, um, and in fact, in that case, there's a, there's a better lower bounds. You can better than this minus two k. You can sort of control how quickly the reeb chords disappear. Um, uh, here, p cross p is a is a an exact symplectic manifold with finite energy, so notably cotangent bundles, and um, so so this case was also done, including with these better bounds, was done in the last Zoom and Arc talk, um, but there uh, Lee replaced um, the existence of uh, an augmentation with in this in that case they needed a, an existence of a sheaf. Uh, globally defined. Um, so there wasn't the L thing there. Uh, but on the other hand, um, that's a, a sort of generalization over the augmentation approach because it's sort of it assumes what's known as a representation, which is somehow an augmentation is an example of a representation. So it's just anyway, I won't get into that because I don't have any statements about representations to say. Okay. Um, then there's the question about how optimal is this bound. So Nakamura last year showed that in some sense this bound for some cases this bound is optimal basically um, if the dimension is at least three and it has a loose chart of this size this size is basically sort of the length of that cord in there that kills the, the dga then the displacement energy of lambda you can you can displace the legendrian from itself with no more than this energy and by displace i didn't define what displacement is but it's basically such that there are no more reeb chords between lambda and its image um, you know, as long as I have, as long as my lower bound here is non-zero, I have, I have not displaced my Legendrian. Uh, so that was in dimension three. Uh, uh, Yorgos and I, in the original paper, we had one example in dimension two to show it was in some sense optimal, much, much weaker statement. We took, all we did is we showed that for a standard unknot in R5, if you put in an arbitrarily small, um, stabilization, which means that L has to be very small for our result, so we don't have much of a result, you can in fact displace the Legendrian from itself with, with a very small amount of energy. So that at least I'm only mentioning that because that at least covers one example in dimension two. Um, also because I get to name name I get to talk about myself some more. So that's another reason why I mentioned it. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So um, next, uh, all right. So that's uh, displaceability. Uh, the, the other quantity, another quantitative result. I want to do metrics, C zero, and squeezing. I've got ten minutes. Let's see which, how much of this I can do. Okay. Um, so uh, recall we had this non-degeneracy of the um, Chikhanov-Hoffer metric and the Chikhanov metric for symplectomorph for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms and for Lagrangians. Uh, so we can also um, study the, the Legendrian version of this. I just find where I am here. 
Okay, so um, so uh, <clears throat> how does that work? So if I take any submanifold of a contact manifold n, I'm calling it n, not lambda, because it could be any submanifold, I can look at its orbit space like I did with the Lagrangians. So in other words, I look for all other submanifolds which can be gotten to it uh, with uh, something in the identity component. some contact homomorphism in the identity component. And I can define uh, I can define what I would call the chikhanov hoffer shalukin metric, because I guess it was Shalukin maybe who showed it was, I forgot. Um, sorry, <laughs> if he's in the audience there. Um, but anyway, uh, I learned about this metric from Rose, uh, Rosen and Zhang, and they called it some combination of chikhanov hoffer shalukin so that's why I'm calling it that. Okay. Uh, and Lishalukin had a paper about this. So yeah, he had a paper about it, but I forgot what the result they, was. They called it this way. <laughs> okay. Very simple. Okay. So he had a paper about it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and um, so we can define it in a similar way. Um, so again, here we need to specify the contact form. So uh, again, we're going to look at the infimum of. Um, You know, in retrospect, I probably should have written this and not the oscillation norm way back when, but no one questioned me about it, so I won't bring it, I won't say more. Um, so we can say, okay, well, how can I move n to n prime uh, use, via one of these contact Hamiltonians? What's the minimum L infinity norm? Yeah, so I think these are all in terms of L infinity norms, not oscillation norms. Um, then, uh, well, now, supposing let's take the n-dimensional case where n is the same dimensional Legendrian, we also study these things which are non-Legendrian if, this is sort of a generalization of being transverse, if there exists an x in the submanifold such that its tangent bundle is not inside the contact distribution. Okay, uh, so that's non-Legendrian. It just has to be non-Legendrian somewhere at some point. We call it non-Legendrian. Okay, and then Rosen and Zhang proved that um, they actually proved it for other dimensions. But if n is non-Legendrian, uh, then um, this this metric is completely degenerate. Uh, you can move a non-Legendrian to somewhere else in its orbit with an arbitrarily small c infinity. Uh, c infinity. In contrast, um, if uh, n is Legendrian then uh, this is non-degenerate. So we get the an analog of Chikhanov, Lalone McDuff. And um, so this was done uh, in a series of papers. So, in this, so Usher did it uh, assuming that uh, N is hypertight. Um, so in this case, this means um, <coughs> no, uh, contra uh, no contractible orbits um, or Reeb chords, uh, pure Reeb chords from lambda itself, which are equal to zero in relative pi one. So he, that's how he was avoiding this, these bubblings. Um, and I'd, I'm, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce this name. I'm just gonna say Hadik. Someone knows, please correct me. Hedike. Uh, sorry, Hedike, those last town has a silk. Hedike, okay. So with non-holomorphic techniques, um, this was proved uh, assuming um, N is orderable. So that means uh, does not sit, uh, does not sit in a positive Legendrian loop. Um, Okay, so, all right, so that was all I wanted to say about displaceability of Legendrians. Okay, all right, and now I wanna to go to the C0 topology statements. Okay, so uh, so we, there was a bunch of results, Elias Gromov, Lauterbach, Sikorov, Opstein, Humia, Leclerc, Sefadini on C0 limits. Uh, of symplectomorphisms or co-isotropic submanifolds. 
Uh, there's a contact analog. Um, let me find where this is. Okay, so contact analog. So uh, if I have a sequence uh, of contact amorphisms, which is uh, C0 converging, and this is a, a diffeomorphism, uh, then in fact, uh, it's a, the limit is a contact morphism. Um, let me just see, am I going to the next page? Yeah, I'm going to the next page. Okay, that's all I wanted to put there. Okay, so that's sort of the, that's sort of row two, column one. That's sort of the closed version of, of C0 topology. Okay, so let's go to row two, column two. So the Legendrian version. Okay, so, um, so suppose this, this statement is only in dimension three, it's the one that I'm going to talk about for us, but there are other statements in higher dimensions. So suppose uh, 5k is in uh, a series of um, contact amorphisms in the, for a three manifold. And uh, again, we have our usual thing. We have C0 convergence, and this is a homeomorphism. And let's suppose that I, I start with the Legendrian such that its limit is smooth. So these are all assumptions. Uh, then, first of all, the, lim the, the, the limit is also Legendrian. And two, um, you can actually find a global contactomorphism uh, uh, such that, not, not the limit itself, but you can find a global contactomorphism such that, uh, not necessarily the limit, um, that will take the original Legendrian to this Legendrian limit. Um, so there are several partial results in higher dimensions. Um, so uh, Rosen and Zhang proved, so there's two statements here. So they, so they proved the first statement uh, assuming, uh, I'm going to go quick here, assuming that there's um, uh, some uniform convergence on uh, the conformal factor fi. So here, con here uh, conformal factor means, uh, so just because we have a, a contact morphism that preserves the contact structure, it doesn't mean it preserves the contact form. So that defines what we call uh, a conformal factor fi. How is the, uh, what did I do there? How does how does the uh, how does the um, contact form change? So they need to assume some sort of uniform convergence. Usher sort of generalized that um, uh, generalized uh, Rose and Zhang, um, uh, assuming <coughs> uh, some sort of lower bounds some sequence of lower bounds, I'll just write it that way, on the FIs. Um, and then Nakamura, in a different direction, um, proves uh, proved this first part, um, also proves the first part, uh, assuming, um, assuming what? Assuming, um, there exists some sort of uh, uniform lower bound on the minimal length of Reeb chords. Um, plus some sort of technical, oops, sorry, plus some sort of technical conditions. Um, but um, but our results from 21 removes those technical conditions as just as an easy corollary. Basically, he was sort of assuming something or else assuming that he could use our eight or 2018 result. Um, OK, uh, I'm actually out of time, so I'm not going to be able to quote you, Leonid. <laughs> you were uh, the last next slide. <laughs> so I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh
Yeah, it's very nice talk. Uh, well, uh, but, but you know kind of the rules of the game, yeah? So we, we have like a few more minutes to, to ask questions and then to discuss. So maybe I will start with a question. So what you can say about non-squeezing? Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm always glad, actually, I'm always glad when anyone's asked that question because then that means if it's not asked that question, they're like, okay, we're ready to go. Uh, okay, non-squeezing. Um, maybe let me try to say quickly, um, since it's rather than writing it down, I'm sorry, my sheets are all out of order here. Um, squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Okay, so, um, all right, so basically, um, there's sort of two different approaches to results here. So, so you guys had a result about squeezing in non-squeezing and squeezing, uh, but you you had a not you had a, this kind of non-squeezing result where you just can map it with a contact amorphism, uh, <clears throat> a contact amorphism, which is part of a contact isotopy, get the closure of U into, into V. Um, so we have sort of two different non-squeezing results. Um, maybe I'll just say um, that, um, Maybe I should just mention the three-dimensional result. Uh, so we have to assume sort of a slightly stronger squeezing. Um, so um, so if you take um, if you take this is this this definition is in general, but uh, we're only going to think of think of k prime and k as Legendrian knots inside a three-manifold. Uh, so, um, so we have this stronger condition on squeezing where we say if there exists some set of numbers going to zero such that um, uh, for all t, uh, um, this, um, I'll call them knots because that's really what I'm thinking of, this knot is squeezed inside a sort of tubular, a small tubular neighborhood of the other knot. And, and here's our additional condition. And uh, during this process, eventually, um, the squeeze knot is smoothly isotopic uh, 2K inside this ball. So there might be some topology, uh, which maybe maybe I can't quite do that otherwise. Um, so this is what we call what we say squeezing. So you can squeeze it into the ball. And then once you're in there, you can have you have an isotopy connecting it to the limiting knot. Um, then, okay, the statement that I wanted to make, oh, I didn't even write this, I didn't even set this up. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, so the most recent thing that we just posted yesterday, so it could be totally wrong because it's only been posted. Um, so uh, let's let um, n in this three manifold be a non-Legendrian. So remember, a non-Legendrian generalizes transverse, and lambda inside m is Legendrian. Um, then uh, one, there is a transverse knot um, T in a small tubular neighborhood of N such that N squeezes onto T. So I can take a non legendary and squeeze it into this transverse knot. However, uh, the Legendrian does not squeeze onto N. So I can't squeeze in this sense, a Legendrian knot onto a non-Legendrian knot. Um, so there are, without this, without this um, 
I have to go back and forth. Well, no, without 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 the second condition here uh, being smoothly isotopic inside the ball, there are counter examples to that. Like there's this ding gigas light bulb trick and so on, and uh, manifolds with some interesting topology. Uh, but yeah, okay. So I guess that's probably there's another sort of squeezing result, but I'll I won't mention that one. Okay, thank you very much. So, more questions, please. Questions, questions. That's the problem when you go too fast. Sorry about that. No, okay. So, uh, then, uh, then I will ask question. Yeah. So, 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 why they mentioned three? So, Oh, yeah. So what I didn't mention here is that this last bit of the talk is not related to the first major portion of the talk. Uh, it's not using the Rabinowitz complex. It's using kind of more traditional methods like Thurston Beneken inequalities and such. So it's ah. not, not so, 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 so this you're proving without court. Without, without holomorphic curves, yeah. No, and without counting of courts. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it doesn't connect as well to the previous. I, I guess maybe I should have done the other squeezing results. Uh, can you say a bit more about the counterexamples without the second condition? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, so Ding and Geiges have this light bulb trick where if you take this contact manifold um, where you have this Legendrian and this Legendrian, these are Legendrian isotopic because you can kind of swing one of the stabilizations around the other. So if you combine that with the fact that Eliasberg's original statement, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing this is Eliasberg, because maybe because I just learned it from him when I was a grad student. Maybe it's not actually him, but I feel like it must be him. Uh, this picture. Um, you can kind of, if, you, if you're allowed to add stabilizations, you can kind of squeeze into anything without the second condition, um, then there would be, you would, you would, you would be able to squeeze. Um, you could take a transverse knot, say running through, say a, a transverse knot running through this handle and um, add more and more stabilization with the ding gigas light bulb trick and then approximate the transverse knot. But in doing so, you're kind of doing a global isotopy each time to go from, to decrease the stabilizations, you sort of have to go, swing around this handle, swing around this attaching region. Mm -hmm. oh. <clears throat> so like then, then in particular, then the, um... The smoothly, it would, it would, it would be smoothly isotopic to K, but not in the ball around. Not in, that's right. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So more questions. And what do you say about the loose chart? So at some point you you mentioned that you can estimate the size of the loose chart by your method. So can you yeah. can you elaborate? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess if you were to use, let's see, uh, where was this? Going back to the displacement result, I guess. Um, wait, where's this statement? Here. Uh, yeah, I mean. If you have, I don't know if this is exactly what you're asking, but but if I had like say a big loose chart, so by that I mean I have a chord here, which is size one or something or two or three, uh, then I wouldn't be able to displace. Let's say that's the smallest loose chart. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm not not just having a big loose chart is not good enough. But supposing I could say that the 
smallest loose chart is that size. Then I would not be able to displace the Legendrian from itself with a Hamiltonian uh, controlled by the length of this, uh, this chord. Again, there's another thing coming in here. I need to be able to augment. There might be some, there might be some pure chord which is, you know, smaller, not responsible for the loose chart, but disrupting the ability to augment my Lejean, my my DGA, and that would cut my bound down. But if for some reason this is the so somehow not only is it the smallest loose chart, but it's also the smallest thing that's causing me problems with augmentations, I wouldn't be able to displace it. So this is sort of the rigid direction and, and Nakamura shows the other, the flexible direction coming in and meeting it and saying, okay, well, if there is a loose chart of that size, then you, you know, um, then, uh, right, then you can displace it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, yeah, that's, that would be the relation. Okay, thank you. So final call for questions. Um, I could have just add something to that, if I'm allowed to, to, the, to the last discussion. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit interesting with this uh, Nakamura's result, saying that if, in some sense, if you have the stabilization of a certain size, then any isotopy can be realized by, at most, you, you need at most roughly some related quantity then. As long as you have a small stabilization, then any any isotopy can be realized by. Uh, well, if, if the initial Legendre and the end Legendre has a small stabilization, then you can go between them with this kind of very good control of the size. But maybe it would be interesting to say if you could also uh, deduce the existence of a stabilization for such a property, because it's the, the definition of, of looseness is just in terms of this H principle. But uh, maybe, maybe this quantitative type of flexibility also characterizes looseness, but that's, that's very unclear. It would be mm -hmm. nice if that is the case, but I have no, it, it, sounds, it sounds difficult, but it is, it is very difficult to determine if something actually is loose. It might uh, look like it's loose from many points of view and so on, it might be have vanishing invariants and everything, but we actually don't really know any way to actually check that it's loose except verifying that it satisfies this H principle, which is pretty difficult. Maybe this quantitative H principle is more easier, easier to show, but on the other hand, we, we don't know if it applies to this. Just a remark. Okay, so great. Thank you very much. So let's uh, thank uh, Michael again for a very nice thank talk.